Hospital City. Oh, this is just messed up. This is messed up. Yes, I was very fruity. <clears throat> Jinx it, to say the least. Whatever that means. Whatever that means. I don't know what you're talking about, kind of person. What are you talking about? Who are you talking about, Dad? Good for him. Good luck, good luck, Dad. I'm sorry your, you know what, what is not doing well. Sorry. Sorry. Goodbye, Dad. Love you. I'm, we just. Good luck, good luck, Dad. Stream well. Good luck, Dad. Some more worse. No. Not her. I think I'm ditch. Look along. Oh, we're in a good. Thank you. One second. Dumbest person I've worked with. Dumb and impatient and rude. Very nasty. Oh, yeah. Oh, damn. Sorry, sorry. Sorry, Joe. Yeah, no, it just hurts. <laughs> damn. Stop apologizing, you dumbass. Damn. Tell you every fucking time and you still fucking do it. Like, don't fucking apologize when, when you keep doing it. Fucking dumbass. Damn. Jeez. So impatient full of anchor issues too. That so-called therapy is not working. Makes them actually worse. Sorry, sorry. Shut the fuck up. Speaking on the generalization, um, any person, not just children, but any person who injures self or someone else accidentally by either playing with a weapon or not knowing the weapon was loaded or whatever it was that led to the shooting, they're going to be impacted. They're going to be traumatized. Both physical trauma because of the injury and psychological trauma, not just because of the injury, but because of the devastation and the shock that comes with it. Obviously, if you're dealing with a child, depending on the age of understanding and their ability to process information and big feelings and all those things, it could be very devastating because they don't necessarily understand or have the experience or the mindset to understand what really happened, right? So that is going to be truly devastating. And of course, you're going to want to make sure that that child, that individual has a support that may be counseling or therapy. Again, age appropriate. Not everyone needs counseling or therapy, but that may be an option for someone who has accidentally shot themselves or someone else uh, because there is going to be a mental and physical and psychological trauma because of that. And what about for the families involved? And that includes the family of the child or teen handling the gun, as well as the family of the person who was injured in the incident. Well, as you can imagine, it's devastating. 
And so for the family who were the owners of the weapon that was involved, there's probably going to be a lot of guilt. There's going to be a lot of regret. Yeah, there's going to be, going, you know, know just the going. inability at first to even face it. And there may be some denial, you know. It's going to be difficult to face the family of the injured party, right? And there's going to be that difficulty. Maybe there was a relationship. Maybe you were neighbors. Maybe you were family. You know, there may be some fractures that come because of the relationship they were with strangers. You know, it's still going to be that same feeling of guilt on the part of the God owner and a feeling of devastation and maybe anger and disillusionment on the part of the injured party. And so that is the devastation of that kind of tragedy, even if it's accidental. You know, the accident doesn't change the result. The fact that it wasn't intentional doesn't change the outcome, right? And so the injury is still the injury. The devastation is still the devastation. And so the guilt of the party that owned the weapon is going to be palpable and remorse, probably, and regret. And again, on the other side, the injured party, the same thing. It doesn't matter that it wasn't intentional or that it wasn't on purpose. The end result is the end result. The devastation is the devastation. The injury is the injury. And so those are the things that both parties can look at. And from a mental health standpoint, there may be some depression and some anxiety, being anxious around loud noises, being traumatized. Again, even seeing a weapon, even seeing one on TV, or you maybe not even be able to watch certain movies or certain programs. And so it can carry into what they call post traumatic stress disorder because even after the incident is over, even after the physical body has healed, the mind and the spirit may still be traumatized and dealing with that tragedy and that accident. So uh, there's a lot of things that are going on on both sides, both for the injured party and for the person who accidentally caused harm. We've spoken a lot about gun owners keeping guns out of the reach of children in their homes or places they control. What about other places? How might a parent or guardian inquire about gun safety at a home their children might be visiting? Wow, yeah, that's uh, that's something that I don't often think about. Um, I think, one, what kind of relationship do you have with the primary caregiver or parents in the home where your child may be visiting? I think it's perfectly reasonable to have a relationship with your children's friends. Now, that was not even an issue many, many years ago. It may be now. We don't always know our children's friends. But if you're contemplating allowing your child to spend the night outside of your home in another person's home, I think you need to know what kind of people they are and what activities are going to be going on and where they're going to be. I know parents who have actually visited the home if they are, are not totally familiar with the parents of the young person. Meet the parents. Get a sense of who they are and then you can have those kind of conversations once you get to know. It may not be a cold call conversation that you, you know, as soon as your child comes home and say, hey, can I spend the night with Johnny or Susie or whoever, that you pick up the phone and say, hey, you know, I'm Dwight's dad, I'm Dwight's mom, you know, if they're thinking about having a sleepover, do you have weapons in the home? That's not how I would approach it. I would approach it from the standpoint, again, depending on how familiar you are with the parent, I would ask if we could have some tea or coffee. I would say, hey, you know, I know your child, Johnny or Susie's friend, um, we'd love to meet you guys. You know, is that possible? And kind of see what kind of vibe you get from that. You know, that's an open invitation to your child. I don't think a parent or a primary caregiver should feel any qualms about getting to know the parent or the primary caregiver of their children's friends. So that's number one. What is your relationship already? If you don't have one, you can try to create one, at least from the standpoint of finding out a place you can place you with your child to spend the night. I think that's personally perfectly reasonable. And I would expect every parent and primary caregiver to do their due diligence. So depending on the answers to that, how close is the relationship already? You know, is this a child of your child's best friend? Or is this somebody that you just met? You don't really know them very well. These are things that you need to tease out as a parent. And then you make an ultimate decision as to whether you think your child will be safe in that home. And so I don't think the question of do you own a weapon or do you own guns should be the first question that comes up. I think there's a lot of conversation and a lot of meet and greet that can take place to even get a sense of where they need to go for that question. You may meet the parents and find out that, you know what, well, this is probably not a situation I want my child to be in regardless, right? And you don't have to get to the conversation about guns. You've already met them, you've been in the home, you're like, okay, yeah, this is probably not what I want to do. Or if they're not inclined to want to meet with you and not inclined to want to have a conversation with you about your child spending the night with them and their child, that's another red flag. And that's okay, well, okay, fine, thank you for sharing. No, you won't be spending the night, you know, that kind of thing. Again, those conversations are going to be different if you have a relationship with the parent, the primary caregiver, or your child's best friend that they are considered to spend the night. So I think a parent has every right and every reason to do their due diligence in finding out the environment in the home of what they may be considering allowing their child to spend the night. Is there a racial component to this, or is it the same sad, tragic story in every community?
personal information, including birth dates, driver's license numbers, and credit card information that could be sold on the dark web. Black Mayor Eric Adams says the city will never ask for payment via text message. NFL rookie Kyrie Jackson is dead after a car crash in Maryland. Minnesota Vikings drafted the 21-year-old cornerback in April. Officials say he and two former high school teammates, Isaiah Hazel and Anthony Lynn Jr., were driving to the southeast of Washington, D.C. early Saturday morning when they were hit by another car. The impact forced their car off the road and Jackson and Hazel were killed. Liddy was taken to a hospital where he later died. No one in the other car was injured. That's the latest. I'm Amber Payton on your home for 24-7 News, the Black Information Network. I'm Erin McCready. And I'm Kevin Brown. And you're home for 24-7 News, the Black Information Network. More than half of Americans in a new poll say President Biden isn't fit to serve another term in the Oval Office. The Yahoo News YouGov survey found 60% of respondents said Biden is unfit for another term, while just 24% said he is, and 60% said they're unsure. Meanwhile, 46% said Donald Trump is fit for a second term. This as governors of Minnesota, Maryland, and New York are throwing their support behind the president after a recent meeting. Minnesota Governor Tim Walsh reiterating his commitment to the president and set a path to victory in November is the number one priority, and Maryland Governor Wes Moore called the meeting honest and candid, saying the governors were able to lay out concerns they have regarding Biden's campaign. The 2024 presidential election will be historically consequential. Black voters in Georgia are proving to be a major focus for Republicans and Democrats vying for this pivot voting block. Political strategist Dante Carter says representation matters, especially in suburbs like Sandy Springs. I think that's why the black vote's been so potent, so powerful. We've been fighting a system of injustice for so long. Black folks have known we're not a monolith, right? That comparison is coming from the people outside of our community. Black voters have played a key role in recent contentious elections, with exit polls showing they played a key role in Biden's narrow victory in Georgia four years ago. Carter told NBC News black voters in battleground states can easily become the deciding factor this year. We understand how powerful the black vote is. Now it's time to get something out of it. The Republican Party has gained ground in Georgia since the last election, and perceptions about the high cost of inflation have dampened enthusiasm for Biden among some black voters. Political experts say it's possible that a broad swath of apathetic left-leaning voters won't show up at the polls in November. All right, well, the largest public school district in Kansas will revise its disciplinary practices as part of a settlement with the U.S. Justice Department. The action resolves a federal civil rights investigation that found educators engaged in a pattern of discrimination against black and disabled students. The Wichita Public Schools District will implement changes to end its use of seclusion, reform restraint techniques, and end student referrals to law enforcement for routine school disciplinary matters. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit has ruled that students at a fake university in Michigan set up by Immigration and Customs Enforcement can sue the government. School in Farmington Hills was part of an operation targeting students trying to extend their visas. Asia Ravi filed a complaint in 2020 individually and on behalf of other students for breach of contract since tuition money was accepted but educational services were never provided. Ravi's attorney says the ICE-operated university collected $6 million in payments. About 600 students lost their visas and some were held at immigration detention centers. I'm Terry McCready along with Kevin Brown on your home for 24-7 News, the Black Information Network.
7 News on San Francisco's BIN 910. California Governor Gavin Newsom offered a forceful defense of embattled President Joe Biden, telling Democrats in Michigan the 81-year-old president has a record of energy to win a second term despite widespread doubt about his ability to campaign or govern effectively. Newsom's pitch at a local Independence Day picnic is part of an effort from Biden's re-election campaign and the White House to reassure party activists and the broader electorate that Biden is up for the job after he appeared rattled in his debate against former President Donald Trump. This is a serious moment in American history. It's not complicated, Newsom told Van Buren County Democrats, turning their attention to the prospects of another Trump presidency. What I need to do is convince you is not to be fatalistic, not to fall prey to all this negativity. Do more, worry less. The president's press secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, who is black, also defending the president about his poor debate performance, again, when asked by reporters. He talked about, he owned that the debate was not his best night, uh, and, it, and he said himself, it's not an excuse, but it's an explanation. I was standing here yesterday, and many people were asking why and what's the explanation, and that's what you heard from him. Look, the two, I think, um, in addition to the two major trips, uh, he was also uh, doing, continued to do his presidential duties. He worked late in doing that, and he also prepared for the debate. And on top of that, there was obviously the jet lag, as you just asked, asked about, and also he had a cold. And you all heard directly, you heard, you heard from him during the debate, he had a horse boy. She also talked about the support that has now rallied around him since the debate to show they want him to battle Donald Trump until the end. Senate Majority Leader Schumer, Representative Clyburn, former Speaker Pelosi, and Senator Kuhn. And as Governor Wolf of Minnesota announced today, the president will meet with more than 20 Democratic governors. Now, as you know, these governors are some of our closest partners when it comes to creating jobs, building new roads, and building bridges, and so much more. And so the president certainly looks forward to meeting with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 